Whenever NES games get re-released, it always feels like a cool thing. Playing the games themselves kinda makes me notice, with all due respect, that most of these are cute distractions, with one exception. One game feels ahead of its time and quite incredible compared to the rest of the library, that game being Kirby's Adventure. They were in line with this title, this game is an adventure. Impressive visuals, a plethora of copy abilities, ever-changing levels that feel like they're revolving next to the player. Though it might suffer from being a little bit overambitious, Adventure ends up being one of the best games of the series and of its era. Simply put, I have nothing but respect for Kirby's Adventure. And then, they remade it. Hello everyone, it's me, Savvy, and today, I have a dilemma. A big one at that. Nightmare in Dreamland is somehow one of the best and worst Kirby games of all time, and I have no idea how to feel about that. Everything about his existence feels contradictory, and yet, I think it somehow also is a quintessential Kirby experience. So that's what I'm here for today, exploring this clusterfuck of a game and figuring it out. And by it, I mean everything. The year is 2002. The anime was going strong and for a long time it was the only piece of Kirby media the fans could feast on alongside Air Ride. And this was also the beginning of what I like to call the we have no idea what the fuck we're doing right now era. With the arrival of the Game Boy Advance, how needed to get our new Kirby game to coincide with the series? They needed something and they needed it fast. E3 comes and goes with the announcement of a brand spanking new Kirby game, asterisk, that being Kirby Nightmare in Dreamland. A remake of Adventure. Huh. This was not common practice for the series at the time. I mean, we did get a remake slash sequel of Kirby Star Stacker, as well as an abridged version of Kirby's Dreamland and Superstar, but never before that did we get full on remakes or even remasters, so this was pretty interesting. Now, the fact that this would be a remake and not a new game wasn't what the devs had in mind at first. Sakurai, who had the pretty important role of being the designer of this game, had thought about making a new Kirby game. But with the need of delivering a new game quickly, they decided to remake a game. The team thought about remaking an SNES title, but then quickly shifted their attention to Adventure. Honestly, it was the perfect choice. If what they wanted to go for was an anime-esque game, there's a lot of things that made sense in Adventure that would be comparable to the anime itself. Nightmare being the main villain, Deity also being an apparently villainous figures at first, Manlight functioning as both a rival and a mentor, a huge focus on abilities, it felt like the perfect fit. Adventure was also a great pick because of how the game was structured, levels were very short so they made for a perfect handheld title. Now, with all that being said, much of the game's marketing, at least in the United States, was centered around the ongoing anime. There's this super iconic commercial which pays homage to the song Secret Agent Man by Johnny Rivers, making Kirby seem like there's some kind of superhero or agent defending Dreamland. Another way that the game was marketed was of course through its box art, which originally looked like this. This is borderline false advertisement. No, wait, wait, no, actually, it is a false advertisement. Many of the characters here don't even show up in the game, and they were never planned to. At the very least, it's fun to look at this. Probably, those who were given the task to promote the game knew that it was going to be an anime tie-in, leading to it looking like this. Interesting thing is that the logo might have been the basis for the one later used in the infamous Kirby Red Diamond bootleg. So overall, between commercials and other ways, they managed to promote this as THE anime game. 69 meters. The culmination of this led to the final box art, so let's take a look. What the fuck is this? A simple black background with Mennonite Knight looking menacingly, the logo, and a render of Fighter from Kirby Red Bacatcha. Apart from the fact that this box sucks, it also is, much like the earlier one, pretty much false advertisement. This is a render of Fighter from the anime, which mind you, isn't an adventure. The only ability that looks like this in the game is Backdrop, but that wasn't in the anime, so they just straight up took a render of a different ability. An ability that was in the anime in the game is Throw, but in both the anime and the game, its bandana is blue. The simple answer would be that whoever made this thought that the render looked cool and would make for a great ability used in Brawl material, but as the mentally ill fuck I am, this bothers me on multiple levels. If they wanted an ability that could have been recognized by the fans of the anime, as well as being in the game, they could have gone with Sword. But no, they went with that one ability which isn't even in the game. Still, I shouldn't judge a book by its cover, so let's play the actual game and see if it lives up to all of our expectations. 
booting up the game, and bam, we're greeted to every single Kirby sprite in the game running on screen to then show the title of the game. The Kirby series has always liked showcasing the power of the consoles they're in, and this was no exception. This was done as a way to showcase how impressive the GBA really was, specifically its capability of showing a plethora of sprites at once without any issue. Going through some very Sakurai Wife-esque menus will lead us to, well, Kirby's Adventure. The game's pretty much the same with a few changes, very substantial changes at that. First of all, the way Kirby moves and is controlled. Whereas in the original you had to push the up arrow multiple times to keep floating, in Nightmare you can press the jump button multiple times, which is definitely far more convenient and smoother. Kirby is also generally faster, which is definitely appreciated. Now, that's pretty much it control-wise, the rest of the game is pretty much the same, except it's not, son of a bitch. So, in the original game, it was pretty clear that we were, in fact, in Dreamland. Pretty weird place. One moment you were in a tower, the next, bam, grass. The levels were super pretty nonetheless and have some incredibly memorable set pieces, but even then, the art direction in these levels was pretty objectively all over the place. Would you believe me if I said that they artistically managed to make it even more fucked up? Yes, I think that the graphics are overall quite better than the original, with these sprites now having these bald outlines, which makes everything pop, even with the GBA's pretty wacky screen, to say the least. However, even though the characters themselves have had quite the new paint job, a lot of the charm present in the levels themselves has been stripped away. A pretty good example is in the second level of Fort 1, where in a cave-esque area, the original had a little pool of water you couldn't reach, but not after long, you would reach a bunch of water you could swim in. In the remake, that initial water pool is completely gone. You know, it's very minor things most of the time, but then you have stuff like these palms in level 1 of 402, which just turn into these ominous weird floating platforms. The biggest offender of all these changes, or more so downgrades, is butter building. In the original game, using some incredible dark magic, how Samo managed to make this incredible spinning animation which changes depending on Kirby's speed. It genuinely feels like you're running on the tower as enemies come and go high up in the sky. So how did they handle this in the remake? Fog. I don't even want to be too much of a bitch, but god, this is so annoying to me. One of the best set pieces and scenes from the game made into a very boring waiting section. The fog comes in, then it goes out. Also, the tower was made blue. Butter building. You know, it made sense for it to be yellowish, cause butter, you know, but blue? Again, it's not a super big deal, but a lot of what made the original cool was the fact that these levels felt alive in a way, even though they were far from being realistic. To make up for it, the development team added some interesting CGI backgrounds which are quite wonderful actually. I've dunked on this game and will continue to dunk on it for the rest of the video, however, I cannot deny how mesmerizing these look. Some of these straight up look otherworldly, perfectly encapsulating Kirby's fascinating worlds. These are definitely dated, some of these look very early 3D because, well, they are, but even then, they feel so special. Same with the latter half of the game's enemy sprites, which do the funny JoJo thing where they change color palette out of nowhere which makes these later parts of the game stand out as these creatures feel more unique in a way, like they're changing with their environment. Look, they even changed the sky's color like in part 4. Now with all that being said, they fucked up the boss sizes, and it was intentional. And DD looks so fucking huge, why is this game like this? Okay, that's enough bitching about small things, so let's bitch about other things instead. The original adventure had three minigames that could make the player gain more lives. These little games have ever since been a mainstay for the series, but strangely enough, the original games from Adventure got replaced with some new ones in the remake. First off, we have Quick Draw, which is a bit strange. Though it follows the same structure as the original, that of pushing a button as soon as the symbol appears on the screen, the visual style has been revamped to closely resemble the one seen in Superstar Samurai Kirby, which admittedly has become the most iconic one despite it being the second time this concept was done. I'm a pretty big fan of the way these characters were drawn and the outfits that they were given. Now, whereas the original had something called Crane Fever, which was just a simple crane game, nothing comparable to that is present in the remake. We have something called Kirby's Air Grind, which in a way feels like a strange 2D precursor to Air Ride, but not really at the same time, with the goal being to grind for as long as possible without being hit by these spikes in this weird sky track. Overall, not really incredible, but one that I am fond of is Bomb Rally. In a way, it's based on very quick decision making, much like the original's Egg Catcher, but it is far more involved when playing it in multiplayer. Ah, uh, right, the multiplayer! I won't go too deep into it since I've talked about it in depth with my good friend Sonico at his channel a while back, so I advise you to check out that video once you're done with this one. To make a long story short, figuring out multiplayer for this title wasn't an easy task, and all the developers have my utmost respect for trying so hard to make something like this, especially when this was the first time we had 4 player multiplayer like this on top of having 4 different Kirbys on screen at the same time. 
This might sound silly, but having four different characters on screen, on top of them having the ability to change moveset on the fly, isn't as simple as, say, multiplayer for a Mario game. In the end, while it did come out a little bit clunky and limited, it is still by all means functional and an incredibly impressive mode for the time and even today, especially considering that a few months before the release of the game, the multiplayer wasn't even ready. Another important aspect of the game and its marketing was a greater focus on Meta Knight because of his importance in the anime, and considering he already had a pretty substantial role in the original, with this being his game of origin, I cannot wait to see what they did with it. I feel like I'm going insane. So. They want to make Meta Knight important, hence the box art being 70% him. They made him a playable character, which we will get to in just a second. But they also removed the section where he appeared in normal gameplay. See, long before his fight, Meta Knight would casually appear in some stages to aid you by throwing an invincibility candy, which would show the player that he doesn't really mean any harm and he's an anti-hero, in a way. In some of the stages, you can see him sending some of his men, the Meta Knights, to see if Kirby is ready to go against his other foes. Now, those segments are still intact in the remake, but not him showing up to help Kirby. But still, that's a very small detail. Meta Knight would be fortunate enough to be the first character to be playable in what would become a mainstay in the future of the series. That being extra modes that star a character who isn't Kirby. This first mode, Meta Nightmare, doesn't offer too much to be completely honest, but still serves as a great mode. It feels great to play as Meta Knight even if it's just a reskin of swords with altered stats. You end up fighting yourself, which is relatively funny, and you also have an on-screen timer which will push you to complete the game as fast as possible. In fact, you'll need to do it in one sitting since this mode won't save your progress, which won't be the case in future games. Though, if there's one thing which future games would take from Nightmare, that would be the style that this game had. Starting from this game, Kirby would enter a sort of new waiting area. While on the console side of things, people were eagerly waiting for Kirby GCN, which would take a bit to release, the handle side of things kept going strong with more mainline titles that would follow this game's footsteps, going with the same art style, and in the case of Amazing Mirror, even using the same engine. These sprites would become synonymous with Kirby for a long time, to the point that internet culture has cemented these as being THE Kirby sprites, thanks to sprite animations and fan games. The fluidity of the movements shown in Nightmare made these perfect for all sorts of projects compared to the more simple animations shown in the OG Adventure. Apparently, Sakurai was pretty mad about that. He wanted better movement over potentially sluggish looking animation. Sure. Overall, the 32-bit era of Kirby was what Kirby looked like for a long time, with it stopping looking like this only with Return to Dreamland's release. So in the end, Nightmare in Dreamland is somehow one of the most important games in a series, yet one of the most lackluster. On one side of the coin, you have an incredibly influential title that would inspire a whole era of games going forward, with iconic graphics and promotional material that works perfectly as a time capsule of the era of the franchise. And on the other, you have a remake that forgets what made the original so great, taking one too many liberties, removing a lot of its charm, and trying too hard to be something that it really wasn't, that being a Kirby Wreck by Catcha game. Important, yet done so wrong. So many facets that create a game that can only be described as a dilemma, an anomaly, living both outcomes of the normal game release and by doing that, setting itself in the history books. Perfect, yet so fundamentally flawed. And that's why I decided to talk about this game today. Its status in the community always seems to be like a pendulum, appreciated by some, hated by others, all depending on when you ask. Depending on which tier list or ranking you check by the community, the game is either here or here. And frankly, neither of those answers are wrong. It all just depends on how you look at the game. Nightmare is personally a game that I often come back to, as it's very easy to get into and complete in one sitting. It's a very fun title and perfect for beginners, making it a quintessential Kirby title, but the moment you view it as a remake, a lot of those great aspects fall flat. Nightmare in Dreamland is the perfect game for those who simply want a Kirby game to play through, not one to get into the series, that are personally going to Superstar Ultra. It is definitely a title that's worth a shot, but one that becomes incredibly faulty when you change point of view, and for that reason, I'll refrain from giving a rating today, unlike I used to do with my older reviews. Games simply cannot be judged with a score, or a tier, as they include so many facets that make them special or horrible, depending on you, you ask. Games cannot be boiled down to simple numbers, as they include something more. Memories, worlds, experiences, they're a part of us, of the players. And I think that's something perfect to end this video on today. And with that being said, Savvy, out. I think this game is ass, by the way.